This audiobook is brought to you directly from the author. Support her by liking, commenting, and sharing with your friends. This series is filled with paranormal tropes such as faded mates, blood bonding, telepathy between lovers, spicy intimate scenes, a protective, possessive alpha, and so much more. We hope you love the soul blood world, and happy listening. Copyright Copyright 2021 Brenna Harlow, All Rights Reserved This book, or any portion thereof, may not be reproduced or used in any manner whatsoever without the express written permission of the publisher, except for the use of brief quotations in a book review. Chapter 1 Maggie It's been four days since I've been outside of the dorm house, and I'm going fucking insane. No one is allowed to step a foot out of their door, not even for a breath of fresh air, and being stuck inside with five other roommates is maddening. Do you think they'll have anything new to say today? Evelyn asks, twirling her purple hair around her finger. Evelyn is one of the only people in the house I don't mind, so we tend to stick together. In a house like this, having a team of two gets you places. Want to watch The Bachelorette in the living room? Two people in agreement pretty much overrides any of the other opinions that pipe up. And they do, often. Probably not. It's been the same thing all day. No new developments about the origin of the massive black hole that popped up in Detroit. Blah blah blah. I just want to go get my own groceries. These delivery people keep replacing my ranch dressing for the cheap shit. It's not cool. I step around the couch and plop down beside her as she flips the news on despite my complaints. A newscast woman with teased blonde hair and ruby red lipstick appears on the screen as a headline that reads, Mysterious portal that opened in Beacon Park has yet to be explained. Numerous scientists, stumped, scrolls across the bottom of the screen. Four days have passed since the portal, which is now being called a bullet cluster of dark matter, appeared, and we still have no real explanation for its appearance. The government is extending its stay-at-home order for 10 more days, and the president has asked that no one leave their homes until this phenomenon has been sorted. Please stand by for more information as it becomes available to us. The news cuts to a live stream of the Black Mass. It reminds me of that giant jelly bean art piece, the Chicago Cloudgate, except this thing is completely black, like a massive black hole. The only noticeable difference is that it isn't sucking all of us up. Otherwise, we would already be dead. It's still terrifying, and the fact that we're all being forced to stay inside makes everything that much worse. There's nothing to distract myself from the looming possibility that something could go seriously wrong. Footsteps hammer down the stairs behind us, and I turn my head just in time to see Harper exiting the stairwell. Our dorm house is nothing to brag about, but it's surprisingly roomy, especially considering six women live here. Sometimes I go a full week without running into the other girls. All of our schedules seem to differ at school, so normally, only one person is trying to get ready in the bathroom at a time. To say things have become complicated since lockdown is an understatement. Anything new happened yet? Harper asks between a yawn. Nope, I reply, my voice void of any hope. Fuck it then, I'm going back to sleep, Harper says before climbing back up the stairs. A moment of silence passes before Evelyn brings the attention back to the TV. Do you see that? I just can't wrap my head around any of this. I feel like I've woken up in some dystopian novel, and I'm about to meet some hot guy, and we're about to save the world together. It's whack. I roll my eyes. I bet it's just some super-secret government technology, and they're doing some test on the population like they did with syphilis. They did what? Evelyn asks, her brown eyes widening twice their usual size. Uh, never mind. Just as I reach for the remote to change the channel, Lyra and Alora come down the stairs. The two have been inseparable since they moved in. When Alora moved in here, Jezebel gave her shit for wearing glasses, as if the poor girl could help it. Lyra, being Lyra, wasn't having any of it, and gave Jezebel a piece of her mind. After that, they were stuck together like glue. It was the talk of the house when the fight had broken out, but seeing the budding friendship between Lyra and Alora was worth the drama. 
Alora was coming out of her shell more and more. She even came down to drink cheap wine with us last night. I feel like shit, Lyra says as she climbs over the couch, leaving footprints on the suede material. I scoff, wiping my hand over the fabric. Sometimes people have no manners in this house and it shows. Tell me about it, Evelyn replies, snatching the remote back from my hands and turning up the volume on the news. Are we open for business yet? Alora asks, straightening her glasses. Doesn't look like it. They just extended the stay-at-home order. No one's allowed outside except the delivery drivers and emergency workers, I say, combing my hair through my fingertips. It was unnerving, the lack of information, the sudden stop of any normalcy. I felt trapped, and this house was not where I wanted to be. I called my mom and sister last night, and they were safe at home, but it didn't feel right to be away from them while all hell broke loose outside. The news anchor's sudden reappearance breaks my train of thought, and I listen as she speaks into the camera, her forehead creased. Breaking news coming out of Los Angeles. It seems that riots have broken out in most of the city, and people are looting and, am I hearing this right, Frank? It seems that people are breaking into civilian homes and robbing families at gunpoint. We've reached out to the LAPD with no response. Damn, that doesn't sound good. Lyra says, staring at the television. No, that didn't sound good at all. A knot forms in my stomach. I have a feeling that whatever is happening out there is going to get much worse, but I push the thought from my head. There's no use in dwelling in the depths of my own fears. Is anyone hungry? I'm going to go grab some chips, I say, jumping off of the couch and escaping into the kitchen before anyone can reply. I open the freezer door and stick my head inside, breathing in the cold air. Stay calm, Maggie. Just breathe. Everything is going to be just fine. Chapter 2 Maggie What the fuck are you doing? I turn, the high-pitched voice of Jezebel breaking any sense of calm that I had mustered while my head was stuck in the freezer. Nothing, just looking for something to eat. I open the freezer door wide again, this time actually searching for something to cook up. We're out of pretty much everything, of course. Frozen broccoli it is. Hey girls, we're out of chips. Anyone want steamed broccoli? I shout, my voice echoing through the kitchen. Jezebel pays me no mind, as she opens one of the cabinets and pulls out a rice cake. Yes. Lyra shouts from the living room. The people have spoken, and broccoli it is. I pop the bag into the microwave and lean against the counter, my eyes narrowing as they land on Jezebel. She's texting and eating at the same time, crumbs from her cake falling to the floor. I can't believe I got stuck in this shithole. I should be at the Delta house right now, living it up with the other girls. Can you believe they're having a party right now? I roll my eyes. No, Jezebel, I so can't believe it. Why don't you go join them? I ask, my voice mockingly high-pitched. Jezebel snorts. I would if I didn't think I'd get thrown in jail. They've got police on the streets now. Mark got taken in last night. My back straightens. Really? Jezebel nods, smiling now that she had something to gossip about. He streamed it on Instagram last night. They cuffed him and everything. A tingle creeps up my spine. This is all too much, all too quickly. The microwave beeps, and I jump at the noise. Maybe I'm not handling this situation as well as I thought. I plate the food and scoot past Jezebel, carrying five entrees as well as any waitress would at a five-star restaurant. Food is ready. The girls all turn their heads to me, and Evelyn claps her hands. It's hot, I say, passing the plates out to each girl. Jezebel moves through the living room as she exits the kitchen and heads down the hallway to the only bathroom. Hey, don't be in there forever. There are five other girls who live here you know, Evelyn shouts over her shoulder. Jezebel doesn't reply, just continues to saunter away, her pencil skirt swishing against her thighs. I collapse back down onto the couch between Evelyn and Lyra. The news anchor returns to the screen, this time wearing an even more distressing expression. 
God, can't we change this to something else? I'm sick of hearing about the same stuff over and over, I complain. No, wait, Evelyn says, leaning forward and turning up the volume even louder. Something's happening. I turn back to the screen, waiting for the new information to unfold with butterflies in my stomach. Reports coming out of Detroit and now Columbus, Ohio, claim that people are getting attacked inside of their homes. Please, everyone, stay inside. This seems to be some sort of terrorist attack, and the accused are said to have superhuman strength. Frank, am I hearing this right? This can't be right. The news cuts to black, and then the words back in a moment light up the screen. No one says a word. My hand shakes as I set my uneaten plate of food down on the coffee table. Michigan and Ohio are hundreds of miles away, right? Nothing bad is happening here, so we all just need to remain calm. Calm? How the hell are we supposed to remain calm after that, Lyra? What the hell is going on? I say, my chest rising with each of my labored breaths. Evelyn turns the television off, pulls out her cell phone, and begins typing against her screen with vehemence. Ev, what are you doing? I ask, wrapping my arms across my chest. I shudder as a chill runs down my spine, either from the cold or my rising anxiety. I'm pulling up a news podcast, Evelyn murmurs. Alora stands, her normally rosy cheeks turn to chalk white and begins pacing the small living room. Our apartment is abnormally bare, no one really finding a reason to devote time to decorating since we'll be moving out in a few years anyway. The couch and coffee table take up the majority of the room, and the TV is mounted onto the plain gray walls. Alora walks back and forth beside the front door, pausing every few steps to gaze out the window. Evelyn's phone blares to life, and I jump a foot in the air at the sound of the bum-da-bum intro sound effects that start off the podcast. A female voice echoes from the speakers. We're coming to you live from Washington, D.C., as reports have begun to flood in about mysterious beings that have begun staging attacks against Americans in the states of Michigan, Ohio, Indiana, West Virginia, and now even here in D.C. These attacks seem to have no correlation with the looters in L.A., as far as we know. My heart thunders against my chest. Just moments ago the attacks were only in Michigan and Ohio. How could the violence have traveled so quickly? Was this a staged attack? How many people could be in this terrorist group? I'm safe in the studio, but I have to admit that I'm frightened. These things they aren't human. Not human? No. Fucking. Wait. We've got videos coming in left and right, and these beings resemble humans, but please do not underestimate the danger they pose. I have seen them rip apart a woman with their bare hands and drink her blood. The president has been unresponsive, and the military has been doing everything in their power to get this under control, but these monsters don't react to bullets or explosives. Be careful out there, everyone. Stay inside, lock your doors, and may God bless all of America tonight. I can't breathe. They don't react to bullets? Ripping people apart with their bare hands. Drinking blood. I think I'm going to be sick, Lyra says, bounding up from the couch and toward the bathroom. I can hear the door slam against the back wall as Lyra barges in, and then Jezebel cursing over the sounds of Lyra's retching. My mind is whirling, and Evelyn's phone continues to drone on and on about safety precautions and the extension of the stay-at-home order. Yeah, no shit. I sure as hell am not going outside after this, maybe not ever. I glance at the watch on my wrist. It's only noon, and already all hell has broken loose. My brain is experiencing some sort of overdrive malfunction, or maybe this is just shock, but I can't process anything else right now. I should call my mom, check on my friends from my hometown in Georgia, or even do some of the online classes my professor uploaded this morning to distract myself from the impending doom that is certainly on humanity's doorstep. But my brain cannot continue to function like this, not right now. My feet slap against the hardwood floor as I stand, and Evelyn raises her eyebrows. Her lips move but the sounds that come from her mouth don't translate into words that make sense. I step around the couch, 
fully abandoning my steamed broccoli, and climb the stairs to my room. I close my door behind me and collapse onto the floor, hugging my knees to my chest. I can't breathe. I can't breathe. I shove my head between my legs, focusing on getting more oxygen to my aching lungs. My heart feels as if it will beat right out of my chest. Baba dump. Baba dump. Baba dump. I can hear nothing but the sound of my heart, like the crash of a wave as it nears the shore. A panic attack. Another one, but this time it's different. This time, it isn't a final I'm worried about. This time it's a nightmare come to life. I don't know how long I lay like a puddle of bones on the cold floor. I don't even remember collapsing onto my bed, or the lull of sleep as my aching heart gave way to a numbing detachment from reality. All I know is that when the darkness pulled me in, I dreamed of them. People killing people. Death. The end of the fucking world. Chapter 3 Maggie. Maggie. Maggie, wake up. A warm hand rests on my shoulder, shaking me awake as I groan against my pillow. Maggie. Get the fuck up. I squint my eyes and roll on my back so I can properly glare at Harper. The sky is darkening outside my open window, and only the faint glow cast from the streetlight illuminates my room. Harper is well awake though, and the frightened expression she wears forces my mind into awareness. All of the events from today rush forward, and I sit up in bed. What's wrong? I ask, my throat as dry as sandpaper. Harper glances over her shoulder, as if she expects something to jump out from the shadows in the corner of my room. Something bad is happening outside, she whispers, tugging my arm. Come on, let's go downstairs. Everyone is scared. We need to stick together. I toss the blankets off of my sweating body and slide out of bed, my feet hitting the cold hardwood floor. I shiver, from both the cold and my elevated stress levels. When I was trying out for basketball for the first time, this same thing happened. My whole body quaked during the warm-up, and then when it was time for me to shoot the first hoop, I almost vomited on myself. My nerves have always been a problem, and our current situation definitely didn't make things easy. If the world ever goes back to normal, I'm making that therapy appointment I've been putting off, I think. Harper tugs on my arm again, and this time, I let her guide me out of my room and down the stairs. Her angled black hair bobs with each step, and the butterfly tattoo on the back of her neck gives me something to focus on so that I don't hyperventilate. Just breathe. The other girls are waiting downstairs, gathered around the television. Jezebel is pacing behind the couch. Lyra and Evelyn are both sitting, their eyes glued to the news, unblinking and Alora looks like she hasn't moved from her spot in front of the living room window. All of their heads swivel to us when we exit the stairs, and Harper loosens her grip on my arm. What's going on? I ask, moving around Harper as I make my way to the couch. My eyes fall on the television, where the same vague message floats across the screen. Back in a moment, my ass. I glance down at my watch, and the time reads 8.25 p.m. Have I really been asleep for over seven hours? We've been hearing screams and gunshots outside, Evelyn says. My stomach drops, and the shivers begin again. I grab the throw off the back of the couch and wrap it around my shoulders, hugging myself tight. Has the news come back on yet? Or your podcast? I ask my eyes wide. No go on the television, but we were getting updates from the Breaking News Today podcast, up until an hour ago. And Maggie, the things she was reporting were bad. Evelyn hugs her phone to her chest, her eyes pooling with unshed tears. How bad are we talking? Bad, bad. She said that DC was overrun, the White House was burnt to the ground, and the military fought in the streets until they all got killed. Bullets don't pierce their flesh, and they're fast. Super strong. Basically, she said we didn't stand a chance, and then she went off the air. My teeth begin to chatter. What are they? Some kind of animal? Aliens? Evelyn shakes her head slowly. Lyra twists in my direction, her bouncy curls dancing with the swiftness of her movement. 
They're fucking vampires, Maggie. Vampires? No way. Creatures of the night? The sparkling love interest of the century? The thing that sucks your blood before it screws your brains out? No way in hell. I laugh, my voice echoing through the apartment. Shish. Keep your voice down, Jezebel says, slapping the back of her hand against my head as she passes by. I turn and glare at her, spitting venom with my eyes. Oi, Alora says, leaning against the open window. Do you hear that? Hear what? My teeth chatter again, and Evelyn tosses me a concerned look. And then I hear it too. A scream, growing as the distance between us and the victim closes. A woman, and her cries are becoming more urgent and frightened by the minute. Get away from the window, I say, motioning for Alora to join us by the couch. She really needs help, Alora replies, still gazing out the pained glass. Oh god, he's got her. Oh fuck, he's biting her. Alora releases a sob, and I rush to her side and pull her away from the gruesome sight outside. I don't look. I don't think I'm ready to see it with my own eyes, not yet. Um, maybe we should turn all of the lights off and wait this out, I whisper, looking at the other girls. Some of their eyes are puffy, while others look sick or in shock. Jezebel looks the most upset, her normally straight hair is unbrushed and tangled, and her lipstick and eyeliner are both smeared. How could I have slept through all of this? They're all terrified. Someone has to do something, give them some sort of guidance. I don't exactly feel qualified for the task, but it seems like no one else is either. I clear my throat, shake off the tension building around my shoulders, and think. Does anyone else have any ideas that don't involve waiting this out? Because if what you all heard on the news is true, then we can't depend on the military to come and save us, I say, raking my hand through my knotted curls. Jezebel's eyes light up. That's it. The military. I roll my eyes. Did she not just hear what I said? No, look, I hooked up with this guy from the Berryfield base last month. I still have his number. I can call him and get them to evacuate us. Yeah, if he's still alive. I reply, shooting her daggers with my eyes. They said the military was gone in D.C., not everywhere, she replies, already tapping against the screen of her phone. She holds it up to her ear, her eyes widening. It's ringing. I take a step back, and Evelyn and Lyra brush against my shoulders as they stand silently beside me. Alora is sitting in the corner of the room, her head buried against her legs and her red hair cascading down her back as her shoulders shake with silent sobs. Jezebel jumps up and down excitedly, tears forming in her eyes as she begins to speak on the phone. Oh my gosh. Thank God you picked up. You're in the military, right? Please help us. She sniffles, and we all watch her as she listens to his response. Could one of her old Tinder dates really get us out of this mess? I can't help but be hopeful. My throat tightens as she breathes heavily into the phone. Just me and my roommates. Their names? Maggie, Harper, Lyra, Evelyn, and Alora. Yeah, just us. Oh my god, you are a lifesaver. Yeah, same place as last time. We'll be ready. She taps against her phone screen with shaking fingers, ending the call. He said they're coming. They're going to evacuate us. Yeah, but the news said that. Fuck what the news said. I just talked to him. He said they were coming. Lyra and Evelyn look at me, their eyes narrowing with unease. What did we have to lose? Even as we've been standing here, more and more screams can be heard from outside. One thing was for sure, if we stayed here, we would die. If the vampires were as fast and as deadly as they were said to be, then we had no chance at outlasting them. Boarding up our house could only get us so far, and eventually, we would run out of food. I shake my head. We had no other choice. Come on, let's pack our bags. Chapter 4 Maggie As I pad up the stairs and enter my room, reality begins to set in. This is it, the end of days. I close my door behind me and breathe in a single shaky breath. If I could just keep breathing, then everything would be okay. 
The first thing I reach for is my phone. It's been on the charger all day, turned off since last night when it died while I was scrolling social media. I hold the button down on the side, waiting for the screen to light up. Come on, come on. It's been well over 24 hours since I last called my mom. She and my sister must be worried sick about me. I grab my duffel bag from my closet with my other hand as I wait for the phone to turn on, effectively multitasking. My phone begins to buzz like crazy, and I glance at the screen. 52 missed calls. Over a hundred text messages. Holy shit, they've really been worried. I tap the call back button and hold the phone to my head. It rings and rings and rings. Hey, this is Judy. Sorry I couldn't get to the phone right now. Please leave me a message. Beep. Mom, are you okay? I'm sorry I haven't been able to get to the phone. Is Claire okay? Just call me back when you get this. I hang up the phone and check my messages. Mom, are you okay? Mom, honey, call me back. Mom, something bad has happened. Mom, we will always love you, sweetheart. My fingers fly across the screen as I respond. Maggie, Mom, are you alright? I love you too. I'm scared. Please call me back. I shove my phone in the back pocket of my denim jeans and rush to continue packing. Who knows how long it will take the military to show up here. When they do arrive, I need to be ready. The first to go into my bag are my leggings and loose t-shirts, in hopes that wherever they take us will have a gym so I can exercise. Then in goes as many pairs of underwear as I can fit, an extra sports bra, one tube of foundation and mascara, lotion, and an extra pair of sneakers. I pack my bag as if this is just a vacation or a trip out of town. I try not to think about what's coming next because when I do, I start to shake all over again. A mirror hangs directly across from the bed and I get a full visual of myself, the black overstuffed duffel bag hanging from one arm. My chestnut curls are a mess, still must from my earlier nap, and my eyes have black bags underneath them. My brown complexion is unnaturally pale, reminding me of my mother. She would always say that my sister and I looked just like her, but in reality, we were stark replicas of our Latino father. When he got locked up, she refused to even admit that we were half of him. Regardless, she cared for us on her own and she did a damn good job at it. I pull my phone from my pocket one last time, just to be sure that she hasn't tried to call back. No missed calls, no new messages. A silent terror falls down my cheek. I pray they are okay, safe and sound in some bunker while all of this goes down. My sister is smart and witty, but she's only 12. A child can't take care of herself alone, especially not with killers roaming the streets. Maggie, come on. They're here. Evelyn says, slapping her palm against my closed door. I take one last look at my reflection before opening the door, and then Evelyn and I are both racing down the stairs. Jezebel stands in front of the living room window with a large rolling luggage set. My eyes widen, taking in her massive load. Did she not understand the severity of this situation? Was this some kind of spring break vacation to her? God, Jezebel. What the hell? Just as the words leave my mouth, someone bangs on the front door. I freeze, fear paralyzing me in place. Jezebel jumps away from the window, runs to the door, and then yanks it open. She's pushed to the side as four men in army gear filter in, slamming the door closed behind them. Footsteps tear down the stairwell as Lyra, Alora, and Harper come to see what's happened. The men spring to action, all heading in different directions of the apartment, their guns raised. Clear. Clear over here, another says. Two others push past me as I stand with my mouth open, my duffel bag clutched to my chest. Doors slam open as the men race through the house, searching every room for danger. The shields worn over their faces hide their identity, while large assault rifles jut from their hands, though they're careful not to aim at any of us. I clutch Evelyn's hand, squeezing tight, as Alora starts to weep again. Even Jezebel moves closer to us, unable to mask the fear in her eyes. Did they think that we would still be alive if one of those monsters had gotten inside? The men relax at the sight of us, 
and one of them pulls his mask from his face and smiles. His teeth are crooked, but otherwise he looks like a cute guy. Not that I was thinking such thoughts at a time like this. He has blonde hair buzzed short, a straight nose, and his eyes are baby blue. I can see the appeal, but his arrogant posture throws me off. Jezebel falls forward, pulling the guy in for a hug. Oh thank God you're here Jim, she says, crying against his chest. His eyes narrow, but his arm wraps around her back. My name is Josh, Jezebel. I haven't heard from you in a while. To be honest, you were the last person I expected to call. Jezebel pulls back from his grip, whipping her tears on the back of her cardigan sleeve. Well, you know, I just remembered how you were in the military. I knew if anyone could help me it would be you, Jezebel replies, pulling his hand into hers and batting her eyelashes. One of the other men clears his throat, and we all stand by awkwardly. I'm not sure whether I should feel comforted by their presence, or terrified. I'm leaning toward the latter. Josh gazes around the room, making eye contact with each of us as he does so. My unease grows, and when his eyes rest on mine, he smiles. I avert my gaze down to the floor, squeezing Evelyn's hand even tighter. These men have guns, I remind myself. The man standing behind Josh taps him on the shoulder, and he nods his head. Come on, let's get you girls to safety. Are those things out there? Alora asks, her voice shaking. Oh yes, Josh replies, pulling out the clip from his gun and tossing it to the apartment floor. He reaches into his belt and grabs another cartridge and shoves it in the butt of the rifle to reload. But don't you worry. We'll get you out of here in one piece. And with that, the men behind Josh move toward the door. Two stand back as another pulls it open, and then Josh is yelling at us to run. He grabs Jezebel by the hand while two of the other men close in behind us, hurting us out the door. Remember, don't scream. They'll hear you. If you fall or stop running, you're dead, one of the guys says, urging us to keep moving. I take his words to heart, pushing my legs to move faster than they ever have, pulling Evelyn along behind me. Outside it's dark, and some of the street lamps have been busted, broken glass glittering on the street below. I watch as Josh pulls Jezebel down the sidewalk, past a few beat-up cars that are abandoned on the side of the road. I look down at my feet as I run, but then the pavement is stained with red liquid, and I have to train my gaze straight ahead to prevent myself from vomiting. This was not at all what I thought it would be like out here. Screams echo from further down the street, but all I am focused on is the armored vehicle that Josh is lifting Jezebel into. If I can make it there, we can get the hell out of here. The only sounds I can hear are screaming and my own labored breaths. No fire trucks, no police sirens, no paramedics. Only death. But I'm almost there, almost safe. Josh pulls Harper, Lyra, and Alora into the car, and then it's my turn. He grabs me by the waist and hoists me up as I reach for the metal railing screwed into the interior walls and sling myself into the opening of the vehicle. The other girls are huddled together, breathing sporadically. There are metal benches lining the inside of the truck, and I take a seat beside Harper. Lyra is busy trying to calm a hysterical Alora, and Jezebel is simply staring into space, her face void of emotion. Evelyn is pushed into the truck, and I reach out with my arm to pull her inside. The armed men stumble inside one after the other. One of them turns, pointing his gun out the metal doorway, swinging it from side to side as he aims at our unseen enemies. Another one of the soldiers pulls the shield free from his face, revealing dark skin and a hard chiseled jaw. He walks down the aisle of the truck and disappears behind a flap, and then the truck rumbles to life. Josh collapses beside Jezebel, and then we are moving. Chapter 5 Maggie A full minute passes in silence, and the tension grows inside of the vehicle as we continue down the street. The wheels go over so many speed bumps, I'm beginning to think that they aren't speed bumps at all, and that thought brings on more nausea. The back door of the armed truck is now closed, sealed shut with a steel sliding bar. I should feel safe knowing that nothing can get inside, but all I feel is unease. The men stare at us in that same hungry look I've seen many times before. My shoulders shake, and I try to avert my eyes at all cost. 
Stop, Jezebel murmurs. My eyes slide over to her, where she sits beside Josh. He's nuzzling her neck, trailing his hand up her thigh. Oh God! The other two men take off their headgear, and they look between us like they're trying to decide on which dessert they want to try first. My stomach churns. This is not good. I clear my throat, and Josh lifts his head from Jezebel, giving me an annoyed look. I notice the way she scoots further away from him, her hand gripping his wrist to keep it from trailing any further up her skirt. So, where is your commander? I ask. Josh looks at me as if I am stupid, and maybe I am. He laughs, his voice echoing against the metal walls of the truck. I hang on to Evelyn's arm tighter, but I try to keep the fear from showing on my face. I have little success. One of the nameless guards plops down beside Evelyn, slinging his arm around her shoulders. He couldn't make it, Josh says, paying me no mind as he threads his hands through Jezebel's fine blonde hair. Dread nestles itself deep inside my core, and my teeth begin to chatter again as chills rack my body. Fuck this. Today has been a living nightmare, and I'm just ready for it to be over. I sigh and close my eyes. I have a strong suspicion that these men were going to take us to their base and have their way with us, and there would be nothing we could do to stop it. They had guns, and by the size of some of their biceps, they wouldn't even need to use them. Fuck that. What do you mean he couldn't make it? Where are you taking us? Lyra shouts, pulling Alora against her chest. God bless her. She was strong, and if anyone out of our bunch could survive this, it would be her. The girl had spirit. Here's the deal. We are going to take you back to our base, fuck you silly, fill your bellies with babies and save humanity. Josh smiles his wicked smile, not a care in the world for our safety. I knew this was a bad idea. I knew it, and yet I ignored my instincts, and now we're going to have to go through something much worse than dying. Alora starts to sob, her shoulders shaking as tears run down her face. Who could blame her? Josh just rolls his eyes, pulling Jezebel's hand away from his wrist. Listen, if you want to live, you'll do as we say. Don't you see? We don't have a choice. We are the last hope. The base is one of the only safe places left in the world. If you want out, all you have to do is say the word and we can let you go right now. We would die out there. I say, just as another ear-piercing scream echoes from outside the armed vehicle. Josh smiles. Then I expect you to cooperate. You'll be fed and well-nurtured. His hand traces back up Jezebel's skirt, and she whimpers, her hand straining against his as she attempts to push him away. No, don't touch her. Lyra shouts, just as the last masked soldier steps forward from his spot in the corner. Lyra looks up at him, and her bottom lip trembles. He grabs her head and yanks it down to his lifted knee, the force sending a crack through the air. Lyra moans, her hands going to her nose as blood seeps down her face and into her mouth. She collapses back down beside Alora, still conscious but stunned. Wetness slides down my cheeks. Why were they doing this? They should have been out there trying to save people. They should be dead, like the soldiers from DC. The truck lurches to a stop, and my shoulder collides with Harper's as gravity pulls us back. She mutters something under her breath, hugging her arms to her chest. No one moves a muscle. Have we made it to the military base, or is something worse happening? I look to Josh, my throat burning at the sight of his fingers moving underneath Jezebel's skirt. Her eyes are squeezed shut, her lips pressed together in a tight line. Finally, he pulls away and stands. He doesn't seem to be worried, so I guess the vampires taking us out are not in the playbook. At least not yet. All right, everyone up. Move in a straight line to the compound. And remember, if you run, you'll die. Josh grins as the soldier who hurt Lyra moves forward, unlatching the back of the truck. He swings the door open and hops down, his gun already poised forward. Josh claps his hands together. Come on now. We don't have all day. My knees wobble as I stand, pulling Evelyn and Harper up with me. Josh motions us forward, an annoyed expression on his face. Jezebel stands beside him, her face stone cold. 
I grab her wrist and pull her away from him, and Josh smirks. With Jezebel in my grasp, I move toward the exit. The soldier is standing just outside the door, pointing his gun toward a chain-link fence. I have to crouch down to hop out of the vehicle, but I make sure that Jezebel is the next to unboard. Once she's down, I look around, surveying my surroundings. Of course, we are smack dab in the middle of nowhere. We stand in a massive parking lot, empty of cars. A chain-link fence wraps around the base, which has to cover at least a mile in four different directions. I don't see any other buildings in the distance, only dense trees and bush behind the fence and across the road. All thoughts of escape quickly die. We couldn't survive the vampires without a shelter, and there definitely wasn't anywhere to hide out here. Follow me, the unnamed soldier says, and I do. Where else is there to go? We are led to a small building, which looks no larger than a walk-in closet from the outside. Its exterior is chipped red brick, with dingy off-white gutters lining the rooftop. He stops in front of the door, and I expect him to unlock it with a set of keys, but instead, he just tugs it open. We all file into the building, and I realize it only seems small from the outside because it isn't a building at all, it's an entrance. The walls slope downward and the floors do as well. The slight angle isn't enough to be considered a slide, but from this point of view, it sure as hell looks like one. I'm dizzy just by gazing down the hallway, and I squeeze my eyes shut before reopening them again to center myself. Two of the men enter the doorway, carrying all of our luggage in their arms. Josh trails behind them, pulling Jezebel's bag on its wheels. He's smiling from ear to ear, as if he's doing her a favor. Once they're all inside, the door swings shut behind them. Lyra's abuser turns a massive lock, like the kind you see during a bank robbery scene in action movies, sealing our fate forever. Chapter 6 Jaisal This place is not how I imagined it. There are beings here, those that think and speak as we do. When the gate was opened, and my species was set free, I pictured us feeding on the fauna here, and then returning the world to its natural order. I did not expect the doors to our home to close behind us, and I underestimated the amount of blood my people needed to return to their sanity. Nonetheless, it couldn't be helped. I had to do it. My people were dying, and a deal needed to be cut. At least, that is what I continue to tell myself as I roam this forest, feeding on the hoofed creatures that live deep in the woods. The sun has set in the sky, and I watch as a single moon rises in the horizon. How odd that such a world could exist layered upon ours. The smells out here in the dense trees are not as bad as they were in the unnatural cities of these humans. Most all of them were foreign, but the spicy scent of tree bark and sap reminds me of the home I left behind. If I close my mind and walk blindly, I can almost imagine that I am traveling through the gardens of Azure. That vision shatters when I hear a strange mechanical motor, and I glare in its direction. The rumbling is coming from just beyond the trees, and curiosity pulls my feet forward. The humans are soon to be extinct, after all. Why not marvel at their creations, study them so that my people can replicate their advancements? I walk along the clearing, watching as the large machine races down the street on wheels made of black magic. How was this possible? Twin lights shine from the front of the transport, and I shield myself in the shadows as it draws nearer. As it passes, I tense. That is the moment I smell it. A scent so overwhelming, so powerful, that just one smell threatens to override all of my other senses as it passes through my nostrils. It travels down my throat, and I can taste the decadence of whatever blood this being has pumping through its warm body. I shudder, gripping the rough bark of the tree beside me. Whatever it is, I must have it. My first look upon a human was nothing special. They have fear in their eyes, the same as any prey. I've noticed no difference in their scent, and didn't especially want to taste their blood. I much prefer the animals, the ones with outspoken thoughts clouding their brains. Whoever was in the metal box that sputters down the roadway was different than the others, and the need to sink my teeth into their flesh for just one taste is too overwhelming to control. I follow the moving machine as it turns and parks beside a lone structure. 
A fence lines the property, though it is not latched shut. My lips curl upward, and I bite back the laughter that threatens to spill from my mouth. Do they think that such boundaries will stop me from getting inside their precious home? I think not. The door to the back of the box opens, and a man spills forth. The scent grows, and I take a step forward, leaving the forest behind. And that is when I see her. Brown curls fall from her shoulders, and even from the distance of where I stand, I can see the freckles that dot the brown skin of her cheeks. Her eyes are brown orbs floating against a white backdrop, like the second moon from my homeland. My breath catches in my throat, and I stumble backward. A searing hot ache explodes from my chest, shooting out like an invisible tendril and linking me to her. The calling has chosen. My mate is here. I smile, even as the impossible complications of our pairing filter through my thoughts. It doesn't matter that she is a human, that we are a completely different species, or even that she doesn't drink blood. She is mine. I watch silently as she is grabbed by another male, and a growl builds in my chest. I do not like the way he touches her. As a matter of fact, I don't like the fear that my female shows on her face. She should never be frightened, and she never will be again if I have any say in it. Other women climb out of the truck, but I pay them no mind. My focus is solely on my mate as she moves her head from side to side, swinging her dark curls through the air. I breathe in deeply, inhaling the intoxicating scent that radiates from her skin. I smell more fear. My eyes narrow. Something must be wrong. I cock my head and turn my attention to the other males that are there with them. There is one sure way to know of their intentions, although the last thing I want to do is see into another human's mind. Once was enough, and I think back to the ragged man I encountered when I exited the portal into this world. His clothing was soiled with his own waste, and the only thing of value I could get from his thoughts was the language he was speaking. Once I was able to decipher his mindless ramblings, I was disinterested, disgusted even. But for the sake of my mate's safety, I would invade these vile male's thoughts. I can't wait until Josh lets me have her. It's been too damn long since I've had a girl. I hope she doesn't fight too hard. Maybe I can find a way to roofie her first. Mental images flash before my eyes, and the things this human imagines enrages me so violently that my heart stops beating. My fangs ache and my mouth pools with venom. These men do not respect the females. They want to control them, to use them for their own sick pleasures. They will all die, slowly and painfully. It is a promise I make to myself at that moment, before I race toward the building. Even with my speed, I am too late. They are already through the door before I reach the gate, and I hear the groaning of metal as a large lock clicks into place. My feet slow. I've only just found her, and already, I have failed her. My heart sinks, a hollow feeling taking hold in the wake of my failure. Perhaps I am cursed and that is why things such as these only seem to happen to me. Or better yet, maybe this is my punishment for bringing my people through the void. My sins have been tallied, and now it is time for me to pay. But must she suffer because of my incompetence? It cannot happen. I reach out with my mind, finding her. She is frightened, but her inner voice is like music to my ears. Oh shit. They're going to rape us. Ah, so rape is the word for their disgusting violation of women. If it weren't for the softness of her mind and the gentle tone of her thoughts, I would believe all of humankind to be demons. Seems that the males are the abomination of this land though, not her. The other girls do not have malicious intent either, and the only thoughts that come from their minds are fear-induced. I focus back on my mate. Her safety is my priority and maybe I can find a way in through her eyes. They're arguing. Oh, they're going back outside. If they only leave one of them with us, maybe we can knock him out. Maybe, maybe we can get his gun and kill them. Ah, uh, God, I've never shot a gun before. I smile to myself. Being with her, even in this way, is comforting. And besides that, she has now given me a way in. All I have to do is simply wait. When they come back outside, I will kill them, and then I will free her. 
After that she will be so proud. She will see that I am a worthy mate, and we will complete the calling. She will be mine and I hers, in flesh, blood and soul. Chapter 7 Maggie My stomach churns as I follow the armed men down the hallway. The walls of this space are eggshell white, and the marbled stone floor seems to move beneath my feet as I stumble along after the man with the stone, cold face, his black hair buzzed close to his head. I knew it would start soon, the violation of my mind, body, and soul. The numbness I feel now is only amplified by Jezebel's limp grasp on my arm as I shuffle her along behind me. Soon enough I would be in her headspace as well, just as hurt, just as broken. But fuck them if they think I will go down easy. In my mind, I was already cataloging possible escape routes, in hopes of formulating a plan. They all had guns, but what if one of them gets distracted? Places his weapon down on a tabletop, just in arm's reach of me, their desperate captive. I would take the leap. I would pull the trigger, if that meant that none of us would be hurt. We pass by wooden doors, some left open with papers littering the floor. Each step takes us deeper and deeper into the building, and the feeling of being underground is claustrophobic. I gag, trying to hone in my anxiety and the fear of being trapped, as I continue to stumble after the soldier. No lollygagging, folks. Pick up the pace, Josh says from the back of the line. I don't dare to look back. Seeing the guns being pointed at us makes this whole situation feel more real, dire, like I truly could die with a single slip of his finger. So instead, I continue to march forward, pushing through my own panic. Where is everyone? Lyra asks, her voice lacking the sass it had previously before the truck incident. Josh chuckles, but the slight nervousness in his voice is the most reactive I've heard from him yet. They're gone. Dead, probably. Off to find their families when the news from Washington arrived. I want to ask what exactly they had been told. He had to know more about this than we did. Does he know what the vampires want? Does he know if they have any weaknesses? Probably not, considering the rest of the soldiers seem to have abandoned their post. They didn't have much hope for the rest of us. We are led down the hallway, the bright UV lights flickering on the ceiling. It's giving me a headache, and I doubt anyone here would give me any Tylenol, if they even have any. The slapping of feet against the marbled floor is the only sound that permeates the air for minutes as we march forward. It echoes off the walls, down the corridors that ring like the tunnels of a cavern, deep below the earth. The loudness of the quiet was deafening, and I found myself hoping that someone, anyone, would speak up. Anything to distract me from my own wandering mind. The voice that begins to speak is not one I wish to hear, though. In here, the leader of the line says. He turns abruptly, leading us through the double doors of a large room. The faint smells of freshly baked bread hang in the air. I stand still as I survey the room, and the others enter the door behind me. There are tables both round and square, with chairs and benches strewn around them. Some half-eaten food lays abandoned on blue and yellow trays, and a few half-empty water bottles sit on their sides on the tabletop. It seems as if the people here are left in a hurry, probably in hopes of getting to their families in time. I hope they made it. Come, the black-haired man says, pointing toward an empty table. I grab Jezebel's hand again and pull her alongside me, and the others follow our lead. Alora has finally stopped crying, and Lyra slugs along beside her with slumped shoulders, but at least she is alive. We are all alive, for now. After we're all settled around a rounded table, the soldiers regroup a few paces away from us. Josh sneers as he focuses on whatever conversation they're having. From the constant moving of his lips, it seems like a heated discussion. Shish, I say as Alora's sobbing starts again. Let me see if I can make out what they're saying. Alora hiccups but holds her breath, preventing any more tears from falling. I train my ears in the men's direction, straining to hear their argument. We have to go back out. There may not be another chance after this. Most of the fuckers are distracted by the civilians. We can get in and out. My breath catches. Are they really planning on going back out? 
A chill creeps down my spine, causing me to shiver. In all honesty, I hope they do leave. If they go out again, there's a chance they won't make it back. I breathe in one single shaky breath and try to hear more. You'll stay here with the girls. Don't touch any of them until we get back, then we will decide who belongs to who. My stomach flips, and I have to hold my breath to prevent myself from gagging. Who belongs to who? My hatred burns brighter for these men with every second that passes. Who in their right mind would think it was okay to own another human being, to claim a stake on their life? The blood boils in my veins as my cheeks warm in anger. This was not how my life was going to end. Josh gazes over at us, his eyes pausing on Jezebel. Damn, I feel bad for her. How terrible must it be to know you fucked a complete psycho? I want to position myself in front of her, to shield her from his gaze, but fear grips me in my place. What if he decides he wants me instead? The thought is cowardly, but that sick primal fear holds strong. Josh saunters over, a stagger in his step, as if he's a real hard ass. I glare, but he only has eyes for Jezebel. How's my girl? The light seems to come on behind Jezebel's eyes. I am not yours. I suck in a breath, waiting for whatever backlash is to come. Josh's smile slowly slips from his face, and he crouches down so that he is at eye level with Jezebel as she sits. You are whatever I say you are. This is my home and you are my guest. Josh reaches out a hand and places it against Jezebel's cheek. The fire in her eyes shines bright, and even I can see her hatred flaring as this man touches her. The time for mourning is gone, and now she's pissed. I clear my throat, trying to diffuse the situation, break apart the tension that hangs densely in the air, but I'm too late. Jezebel spits right into Josh's eye. He falls back, a stunned expression on his face before fury replaces it. Oh shit. Josh slowly rises to his full height, the darkness clouding his eyes growing more evil by the minute. One of the soldiers behind him snickers, and Josh's lip twitches. He wipes his hand down his face, smearing the wetness over his skin. You will regret this when I get back. And then he turns, walking stiffly back to the other soldiers. They speak in hushed voices, until the black-haired man nods and begins to make his way toward our table. With one last glare our way, Josh and the other two soldiers turn and leave the room, the door clicking shut behind them. I train my eyes to the man that remains, and I can see a bead of sweat forming on his brow. Oh, does the poor sap feel threatened now that he's alone in a room full of angry women? Even if I can't distract him enough to steal away his weapon, at least I'll have a little fun tormenting him. Hey blockhead, are you going to pass out waters or anything? You don't want us to die before the others come back, do you? I ask, smiling brightly and fluttering my eyelashes for good measure. The soldier's Adam's apple bobs as he swallows. A right water. He glances at the machine on the other side of the room, and then back to us. Stay here, he says, gesturing at our table with the gun. As soon as he crosses the room, I turn to the girls. All right, this is what we need to do. Chapter 8 Jaisal I sit atop the building, looking down to the ground below. In mere moments, three men will walk out of the door. I will be upon them before they can blink. My fangs ache to dig deep into their flesh, not because of hunger, but an emotion that runs much deeper. These men have touched my mate, frightened her. They will all die, painfully. As I perch right above the door, waiting, I look out over the horizon. The sun is now long gone, giving way to the large moon that hangs suspended in the sky. Millions of little glittering stars surround it, some so bright that they stand out like splotches of blood on white fabric. It may be different than home, but I can acknowledge the beauty of this world. I remember my mate, with her brown skin and long curls. Even from a distance, I could see the curves of her form and the lines on her face. If I had to choose one thing I liked most about this new plane, it would be her. My heart squeezes at the memory of her frightened eyes. These males will pay for putting fear into her mind. I freeze as heavy footsteps approach from below. Even the wind settles, as if it is holding its breath with me. 
The lock on the other side of the heavy door clicks, and then the door is pushed open wide. Three men stumble out from the threshold with smiles on their faces. My own face mimics theirs, a mockery of their selfish indulgence. I stand silently, as they take more heavy steps forward. And then I let myself fall, down 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 until I hit the solid ground below me with a thud. The three warriors twist, spinning around in that slow clumsy way that humans seem to favor. I am still smiling as their eyes widen, taking in the sight of death on their doorstep. Hello, I say, rasping out the strange language that humans use to speak to one another. Their guns lift in unison. Do you think your silly tools will stop me from ripping those pretty heads from your bodies? I ask, cocking my head to one side. They do not answer me, of course. They only press their fingers against the triggers of their fire, spitting weapons, spraying metal orbs against my skin. I feel pinches, mere annoying flicks against my arms and chest. The bullets do not even scrape my flesh. I laugh, the sound booming from my voice, and watch the expressions change their features from fear to paralyzing terror. I told you so, I grumble, flicking the metal shrapnel from my clothing. What are you? I look up to the male, his eyes shining with wetness. I should feel pity for these helpless beings, but the emotions do not surface. These men have frightened my female. They may have hurt her. No, they do not deserve mercy. You may call me death, I reply, before launching myself at the men. The leader of the pack is easy to pick out. He carries himself in a way that is cowardly, but big. He likes to make others do his dirty work. I leave him for last. My hands grip the first male, and I doubt he even had the time for his mind to catch up with what was happening to him, before my fingers were dug deep into his neck, feeling the warm blood that pumps just below his skin. I savor the moment his life drains from his body as his soul is absorbed by the light, before moving on to the next warrior. This one is coated in the fresh scent of urine, and I finish him quickly so I can escape the smell. His head pops off with a sickening wet rip, and it rolls to the ground as I step away. The remaining warrior looks around at his fallen comrades, quick to comprehend what has happened to them. I lick my hand clean of blood as I wait for his fear to sink in. I want him scared. I want him to understand the fate that awaits. WH, what did you do to them? I roll my eyes. Humans. But then I stop, cursing myself. Not humans. My mate is a human, and she certainly cannot be this dull or slow. So it must be the males then. They are not capable of critical thought, it seems. I have killed them, I say. Licking away the last drop of blood. The male just continues to stare down at the bodies that lay motionless on the ground. I do not have time to wait for him to come to the realization that he will soon be joining them. I sigh and step forward. The man lurches back, tripping over his own feet before landing against the stone ground. I roll my eyes once more. Come and I might let you live, I say, motioning him forward. It is a lie of course, but I am so used to letting them slip from my lips, it feels like second nature. His eyes widen. You'll let me live? Sure I draw out. The warrior slowly rises to his feet. What is your given name, warrior? His brows furrow, and I am close to losing my temper at his silence when he finally speaks. Josh? Ah Josh. I want to know what you have planned to do with the women inside of this building. I point behind me, to the sealed door. Josh licks his lips and averts his eyes. A sinner caught in a web of his own transgressions. Answer me. Josh begins to cry, like a child trying to avoid discipline. We, we saved them. We were going to give them shish, shelter. I tisk. Josh, you are a very bad liar. The human begins to shudder, his fear of death consuming him both physically and mentally. Come now, open the door, I say, placing a hand on the back of his shoulder and patting it. He has the keys to get inside, I know it. Just a simple gaze into his mind shows me that he needs to call the only remaining soldier from inside to open the doors, and then I will be granted access to my female. Her captors will be destroyed, of course. 
I do not tell Josh that though. He needs to feel safe, like I will let him live if he just grants me this one tiny favor. I can't open the door, Josh says, his eyes pooling with more tears. The growl is quick to escape me, and I struggle to rein it back in. Josh crumples, flinching away from me as if I have slapped him. I straighten my jacket, dusting off more metal shards from my earlier role as target practice. Josh, dearest of humans, I know you can open these doors. This, I point to the device strapped to his belt, is how we get inside. Josh lets out a strangled sob, his shoulders sagging in defeat. He pulls the small square from his pants and holds it to his lips. I place my hand over his, stopping him before he can press the button. I suggest you make this believable. Do not give him any reason to turn you away. I smile wide, giving Josh a complete view of my fangs. He shudders and squeezes his eyes closed tight. I release his hand. He knows what to do. I pay close attention to his thoughts as he presses his finger to the button, just in case he has a sudden change of heart. Josh clears his throat. Tanner, come in. The device beeps, and static rings out from its speakers. I wince but push through the discomfort. Only for my mate would I go through such troubles. A deep voice cuts from the white noise of the machine. What's up? I need you to open the door. We forgot something, Josh says, his voice even. I smile, proud that I could instill such fear in this male. Be right there. The square beeps once and then goes silent. Josh snaps the device back into the clasp on his belt. Only a minute passes by before the footsteps of the last warrior sound from behind the door. The lock clicks, and then the door is opening wide. As soon as he sees me, his gun is raised. My grin stays in place even as he hits me, once, twice, ten times. My hand reaches forward, gripping his t-shirt, and I pull him to my chest. From the outside looking in, this could be seen as a lover's embrace. Him in my arms, his head dipped back as my lips rest upon his neck. This was anything but that. I suck deeply, the ache in my fangs pushing me to bite down harder, harder, until I can feel the snap of his neck as it frees from his body. My eyes lift as his iridescent soul leaves his body, trailing up and into the large body of light that appears each time I kill. I snarl and dig my teeth back into his wet flesh, hoping that this apparition can see the monster that I am. The monster that feeds it. Someone behind us screams. It is then that I remember Josh through the delusion of bloodlust. Dear old Josh. The destroyer. The violator of women. The dead. I move forward so fast all he sees is a blur. One last gurgled cry for help is all that remains of the human Josh. As his body goes limp in my arms, I drop him to the ground. All of my thoughts turn to her. My mate. I step inside the strangely shaped tunnel, off to find her and claim her as mine. Chapter 9 Maggie I eye the soldier from where he stands, propped up against the drink machine, his hands resting on his gun. He hasn't returned since he gave us the waters. Our plan will not work unless he comes back to the table. I clear my throat. Hey you. The soldier looks up, his features hardening as he locks eyes with me. I cringe inwardly but force my voice to remain nonchalant. Is there any way we could have something to munch on? We haven't eaten all day. I cock my head to the side, widening my eyes. The puppy dog look always works. Not this time, apparently. The soldier just glares at me through hooded eyes. Damn, I really thought that would work. If we can get him to come over here, we can fight. Lyra has a bottle of hairspray hidden under the table, at the ready. Just one spray straight to the eyes, and we may be able to wrangle the gun from him. It's a stupid plan, but we're desperate. I mean, we can't just wait for them to take us, right? At least not without a fight, however futile it may seem. The walkie-talkie hanging from the soldier's belt beeps, and then becomes static as the voice of Josh sounds from the speakers. Tanner, come in. My eyebrows raise. Now I have a name to go with the face of the man standing across the room. Tanner. It sounds too sweet for him, unfitting of a misogynistic pig. 
Tanner's beefy hands struggle to remove the walkie from his waist. What's up? Tanner replies, casting a wary gaze in our direction. I need you to open the door. We forgot something. My eyebrows raise. What could they have forgotten? Another gun? Their car keys? I snort, and the soldier glares in my direction. Be right there, he replies into the device. Tanner pushes away from the drink machine and stalks forward. I want you all to play nice while I'm gone. Don't try to escape. There won't be a way out. He backs away with his rifle aimed towards us, all the way until he gets to the door, before turning and rushing outside. I stand, already running to the door before I hear the rattle of keys and a lock clicking into place. Damn it. I turn back around, and the other girls look at me hopefully. It's locked. Alora begins to sob again. I stalk back to the table. All of the fear I have felt since we got into that stupid armored vehicle is now souring into anger. Red Hot Fury. How could they do this to us? Did they not have mothers, sisters, other women they cared about? My eyes blur with tears I didn't know were coming. Fuck all right. We wait for him to come back, and we stick to our plan. Distract him, spray him in the eyes, and then get the gun. Evelyn nods, her eyes wide and trusting. This was our only hope. I didn't want to think about what would happen if we failed. Lyra pats Alora on her back, trying to soothe away the tears. I didn't blame her for being scared. Hell, I was terrified. Harper was the least affected of the bunch, and I had my suspicions that it was just a part of her show. She had always been slow to react to drama or issues at our house, but now I believe she's just really fucking good at hiding her pain. She stares straight ahead now, her dark makeup smudged around her eyes the same shade as her dyed hair. None of these girls deserve this. Not even Jezebel, no matter how much of a bitch she is. I settle down back into my seat, wedged between Evelyn and Jezebel. I just want this nightmare to end, Evelyn whispers. Me too, I reply, placing my hand into hers and squeezing. At least we had each other. That was something. I remember my mother. My sister. I had already checked my phone twice, and the soldier didn't even try to take it from me. He must have known there would be no one on the other end. No new messages. No missed calls. Nothing. Please let them be okay. Just then, footsteps sound in the hallway. They approach slowly, and I hold my breath, waiting for another gun to be trained on me as the soldier, Tanner, enters the door. I expect to hear the rattling of keys, of a lock being turned. Instead, I hear the twisting of metal and a bang as the doorknob falls to the floor. Evelyn squeezes my hand even tighter as the door is slowly pushed open and a bloodied figure passes over the threshold. Screaming. Someone is screaming beside me. Alora, Lyra, Evelyn, it has to be one of them. I can't speak, cannot move as he walks to the center of the room. His eyes catch mine and his face transforms. Is this the face of a killer? He's bloody, no doubt. But there is something else, something more. His eyes are black, with crimson red swirls and speckles that flow like the great river Nile. How? My heart squeezes as my mind catches up with reality. He is no man. He is a vampire. Death. Even still, I can't break his gaze. Maybe it's always like this with them. He is a predator, after all. Our locked eyes may be the only thing preventing him from pouncing, like a panther deep in the Amazonian rainforest. He steps closer, his eyes still locked on mine. I push myself out of my chair, sending it flying backward at my sudden movement. I should run, escape, but no matter how much I will it to happen, my legs refuse to bend. The screaming girls fall away from me, like I am being sucked into the snarls of a well-crafted death trap. He has all of my attention. The vampire has raven black hair, cut short on the sides but longer on top. His skin is pale, almost translucent, like I would imagine any of Dracula's children to resemble. Chiseled jaw, high cheekbones, a nose straight to perfection. 
He wears a blood-covered gray sweater with a black trench coat over the top. The garments don't look anything like the modern clothes that people in America wear. His lips part, and behind the blood red stains on his mouth, twin fangs peek out. I am frozen with fear, unable to do anything while the monster's gaze roams over my body. Where are the soldiers? Where are their guns? Is all hope lost? It seems like we may become lunch or dinner by the looks of the fresh blood splattered on the vampire's clothing. That must be why Tanner and the other soldiers haven't returned. They're dead. My mind screams that I should feel pity for them, mourn their lives, but why would I? They deserved their fate. But we don't. I don't. The vampire takes three more strides forward, closing the gap between us. His hands reach out for me, and I stop breathing when they come to rest against my arms. His head dips down low, and in the background I can hear Evelyn crying, begging for him to spare my life. Just as he lowers his head to drink of my blood, he doesn't. His forehead touches mine, our eyes so close I can see nothing but the black and red of his irises. I can feel the warmth of his breath against my cheeks, and his hands as they move up and over my arms. Mine, he says, his voice rough and guttural more animal than man. No. No, this cannot be happening to me. Freed from the binds of vile men who want to violate my body, only to be delivered into the grasp of a man-eating monster who claims me as his. It will not happen. He must sense the shift in my mood from fear to fury. He raises his head back just an inch, one brow raised. Men take and take and take. No more. He cannot have me. No man will own me and if I die, then I die. I grit my teeth, and with the last remaining strength I have, I lurch my leg up and into the crotch of the vampire who does not know boundaries. The breath swooshes from his lungs, and his eyes widen as he falls to his knees, clutching his privates. Damn that felt good. I smile, unable to hold it back. Surely I'll be dead in a moment anyway. Why not die with a grin on my face? I feel hands on my arm, pulling me backward. I stumble, still eyeing the vampire who looks at me like I have betrayed him. The look he gives me does not make me feel good. I swallow thickly, and then turn to Evelyn as she pulls me away. Come on, she says, tears running down her face. I don't argue. Just follow her as she drags me across the room where the other women are huddled in a corner. I guess we will all die together, then. Does she really expect anything less? I mean you no harm. I stop running, freezing in place at the sound of his voice. One glance over my shoulder shows his face, scrunched with pain. No. More than that. Longing? Sadness? Evelyn tugs on my arm again, urging me to keep moving. By the time I make it to the other side of the room, he is turning, stomping through the open doors behind him. W.H. what? Where is he going? Evelyn says. What did he say to you? Harper demands. My hand lifts to my heart, pressing against my chest like I could slow its beating with a single touch. He said I was his. Chapter 10 Jaisal I storm out of the room, the wound delivered by my mate still aching. She will not have me. Rejected. Her physical hit did not hurt more than my pride, and in all honesty, I am happy she fought. But against me, her own mate? It is too much. I should have paid better attention to her thoughts when I approached her. In my mind, I thought the fear scent radiating from her was due to the soldiers, a residue I wished to scrub free from her body with my own hands. The realization that it was me who caused her unease came a bit too late. Just another thing that is wrong in this world, upside down. She does not know that I am her mate, her other half. Or perhaps she does, and she just doesn't find me worthy. Her rejection hurts worse than any physical pain I have ever endured. As soon as I am out of the room, I make my way back down the hallway, to the entrance of this underground dwelling. Should I leave her here? The breath leaves my chest at the idea. No. I cannot abandon her. Not without knowing the truth of why she doesn't want me. I have a few ideas already. 
My hands are caked with already drying blood, and I wipe them against my jacket as I stalk down the hallway. The stains do not come free, not without water to wash them away. A single sigh escapes me as I close the gap between me and the open doorway ahead. It is thick, too much metal to claw through. If any of my people want to get inside, they will have to ask nicely. I smile but it slips from my face. My mate will not be safe around any of my people, not until they find themselves again. Not until their bloodlust is satiated. The pile of problems I have to deal with stack upon my shoulders, as they have for many years. That is the burden of a leader. I close the door tight, turning the metal lock until it clicks into place. No one will be able to enter without permission. And I will not leave until I am forced out by my mate, maybe not even then. Who else is there to protect her from the strength of maddened dampiers, or other males who want to take advantage of her softness? My teeth ache at the thought, ready to tear into the flesh of any who dare to harm her. I turn then, wandering back down the hallway from which I came. Even now, I know she does not want to see my face. All of the other females screech and spill hot wet tears when they see me. She did not cry though. She did not do much more than stare at me when I went to her, touched her. That has to mean something. My lips lift in a small smile. Perhaps I have a chance at winning her heart after all. This building is unnatural. All sharp lines and white walls like the color has been sucked from the surface. It feels wrong, not at all like home. I am not home any longer, I remind myself. I have to get used to these walls, these bare and boring rooms. I pass by door after door. The building is empty, except for the beating hearts of the six women, who still cower from me in the room I left them in. If I am going to make this work, then I will need my own lair. A place to make mine, to feel comfortable. Because no matter how frightened my mate is of me, I will not leave her side. Not until I talk to her, explain who I am and what has happened to the world outside of these walls. She deserves to know the truth about me, about those wild beasts that roam outside of this sanctuary. But first, I must get her to trust me. To see me as a man, instead of a monster. I turn the corner of one of the long corridors and find myself in front of a door, left ajar by someone who was in a hurry to escape this place. I push the wooden door open, letting the scents from inside waft near. Smoke and sweat, mixed with a bitterly sweet smell that reminds me of the nectar that bled from the trees back in Azure. That gentle reminder of home is what beckons me forward, inside the small room. A brown cushioned chair is pushed under a wooden desk inside, and a small table lines the back wall. On top of the table is a bottle, where the sweet scent is the strongest. Red liquid sloshes inside as I lift the glass container. Could this be blood? It certainly doesn't smell like blood. Without letting the scent put me off, I raise the bottle to my lips and drink a mouthful. The liquid has only just touched the back of my throat, before I begin to cough, the burn of the substance trailing down into my stomach. I grimace, placing the bottle back down onto the table. I turn back to the rest of the room and let my eyes glide over its contents. Nothing of much importance stands out. The desk has papers littered about, the floor is the same color as the hallways, it's small. But it will do. As I pull the chair back from the desk and settle into it, I think of my mate, and what I will have to do to ensure that she becomes mine. My nature tells me to just take her, Make her see that she was meant for me and me alone. But I know that is wrong, and I have already met the fierce spirit she carries within her. She would not take kindly to me stealing her away from her friends. Instead, I need to comfort her. Offer my protections. I cannot rush this, or she will fall away from me again. I have to be strategic. My lips lift again, the grin stretching my skin. If there is anything that I am a master at, it is strategy. Or fighting for my people. And now she is my people. I will fight for her the way I have for all of my kind. One step at a time. This concludes Before the Darkest Hour. Blood at First Sight, the continuation of Maggie and the Vampire Story, begins now. Maggie. Chapter 1. 
We need more lotion, Jezebel says, scratching her dry elbow for emphasis. And shampoo. Oh, and if you can find any bath and body works body wash, I'd absolutely take it, Evelyn adds, her eyes dreamy as she imagines lathering herself in the scented goodness. I shake my head silently. For the last two weeks, the vampire has been going outside and retrieving our groceries. A.K.A. whatever the hell he can scavenge from the abandoned stores nearby. I doubt he knows how to find a Bath & Body Works store, Ev. I roll my eyes and sigh in aspiration. Jaisal only stares at me, not paying a bit of attention to the other women. The vampire has been doting on me since the moment he stepped through the door and scared us all shitless. His cold, intense eyes never stray too far from me whenever we're in a room together. It would flatter me by coming from a human man. But him? It's a tad bit creepy and a lot awkward. I rub my fingers together beneath the cafeteria table as my friends make their demands. Harper wants black nail polish. Lyra wants hair detangling spray. Alora wants a med kit and whatever medicine he can find. Everyone asks for something, but I'm not even sure the vampire knows what most of the items are. He doesn't ask for clarification, though. He just stares. His black and crimson eyes pull me into their depths each time I look up, trying to ensnare me in his compulsion-laced gaze. My theory on his hypnosis mind control hasn't been proven yet, but I haven't been able to explain the way he makes me feel whenever I look at him. What else could it be? Knowing what he is, everything he's potentially done? It makes little sense that he'd make me feel so warm. Not unless he's been bending my mind to his will. And so I find myself staring at the table a lot. And you, Maggie? His husky tone catches my attention, and I raise my eyes to his again. Bad idea. The moment our gazes lock, I feel my stomach come to life. Butterflies wielding knives fly from the top of my belly to the bottom, flipping and flopping all around. My leg jumps, bouncing under the table as I swallow the lump in my throat. Um what? He smiles his charming half-smile, nearly taking my breath away. I try to focus on anywhere but his mouth, but it's an impossible feat. Damn compulsion, I think, trying to set my mind back on track. Jaisal cocks his head to the side, his lips curved as if he's holding back a laugh. Do you want me to bring you anything? Perhaps more of the dark chocolate? My stomach growls at the thought, and I lick my lips. The vampire found a bag full of dark chocolate candies last week. He kept them from the other girls, delivering them to my door after dinner, once everyone else was in their own rooms. He called them nectar droplets, saying something about how sweet they smelled and how they reminded him of me. You can bring all of us something sweet if you'd like, I reply, keeping my tone cool. His smile disappears, displeasure written in his features. I still don't know why he set his sights on me. I've given him plenty of hell, making sure I'm the most unapproachable woman in the compound. He could probably have Jezebel in his bed by the end of the week if he gave her an ounce of the attention he's given me. And yet he's unrelenting in his quest to make me feel like I belong in his arms. Mine. I can't forget the word he spoke when we first met. He set his claim on me and me alone, and he doesn't want to give it up. If I could get him to change his mind, I would, but I have no fucking clue how to turn down a vampire. The usual, uninterested attitude isn't working on this dude. Very well, he says standing. I'll leave at sundown. And you'll get the lotion? Jezebel asks in a whining tone, looking up at the vampire from her chair with puppy dog eyes. Jaisal pulls a hand through his thick black hair, sighing. I'll do my best. His gaze cuts from her to me, as if he's directing the statement at both of us. A chill runs over my spine, tingling all the way through my body. He saunters out of the room, letting one side of the double doors swing shut behind him. Lyra blows out a long breath, staring after the vampire. Dude is intense, she mumbles. Isn't he? It's like he's always stuck between being a hard-ass and a hopeless romantic. Evelyn says, darting a look in my direction and wiggling her eyebrows. I kick her leg under the table, frowning. 
He's a vampire. Maybe that's just how they act. Lyra snorts. Not all of them. Some like to throw down by munching on throats. She gestures to the door with a flick of her wrist. That one is special. I'm not so sure that special is the right word, but I don't argue. Alora tosses her leg over the bench and stands. He's quite interesting. If I had to guess, I'd say he's just a few evolutionary steps ahead of us humans. He evolved in an unfamiliar environment, of course, but his skills are impeccable. If we had even an ounce of the strength the vampires had, we'd be unstoppable. I doubt that. If we had the strength of a vampire, we'd just put up more of a fight. Not only are they strong, but they're fast, and their bite is deadly. All it would take is a single bloodsucker to get through the steel doors of our hideout, and we'd all be toast. Our only saving grace is that we have a secret weapon of our own. Jaisal. And he claims he'll help us, even to the point of killing his own people. Alora grabs her sling bag from the table and pushes the bridge of her glasses up her nose. I'll be in the library if anyone needs me. She smiles at Lyra before parting from the group, leaving in a hurry. She's always the first to leave after Jaisal leaves the room. The others and I all hang back, scared of being in his presence again, but unwilling to admit it. Alora may be a ball of anxiety, but she isn't scared of the vampire. Not in the slightest. I, however, fear him the most. Just, not for the same reason as everyone else does. I'm scared of the way he causes my heart to beat twice its resting rate. I'm terrified of the things he makes me wish I could do. Giving in to these temptations isn't on my agenda though, regardless of whether it's compulsion or my own fucked up hormones that's causing my unusual attraction to him. So, Evelyn says, slapping her palms on the table. Who's hungry? I hear pork and beans are on the menu tonight. Again, I add silently. Jezebel groans loud and long, flattening her head against the table. Just kill me now, she grumbles. I could eat, I say, following Evelyn as she dislodges herself from the bench and heads toward the kitchen.